Am I coming back on here? Hey, amen. All right, so where are we at here? So you're enjoying favor with the people? Oh, we are at the Holy Spirit is not optional equipment. Say amen. All right, good. <clears throat> So what we're going to do is we're going to just move very quickly through the book of Acts, maybe 10 more minutes, and then I want to talk to you about ecclesia and the home, and then um, I want to, uh, we're going to move into a commissioning tunnel. We're going to commission every, we're going to lay hands on everybody again, and we're going to commission you, and it's a different focus. Because we conferred on you, but now we're going to commission you. And we're going to commission you with this understanding that we need, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So when you go through that tunnel, we're going we're gonna to release what we have over you. Just an impartation. And so we're going to have probably five or six, maybe ten people in that line, and they're just going to pray for you, and you're just going to get filled up. Are you ready for that? That's what's going to happen, all right? So you're going to go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Amen. So they were adding people daily of those who were being saved. So in the first year, like I've said before, in the first year, they filled the whole city with, its, with the doctrine of Jesus, noting Acts chapter 1 through 8 covers about Oh, 1.5 years. So we read in Acts chapter 5, verse 28. Now, you have to understand there's a religious, there's always a religious side that's not connected to Christ's ecclesia. So we have to understand there's a religious spirit and there's a political spirit. Because Jesus said, remember he said, be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. Like the religious spirit and the political spirit will always try and shut down Christ's ecclesia. But that'll never happen. But I'm saying that there's an attempt. So in Acts 5.28, it says, now the religious ecclesia, called the Sanhedrin, they told these disciples, I mean, they are just born again. I mean, fresh, born again, loving Jesus. They said, we give you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. The ecclesia, in, in one and a half years, we found 20,000 Jews being saved. The Sanhedrin knows it's totally out of control. They've lost control. Their ecclesia is bankrupt. They, they are desperate. And they are trying to shut them down in Acts chapter 5, 28. But an ecclesia is unstoppable. Can't stop it. You can't stop the government of God when it has the Holy Spirit on it. They have now, they have both authority and and ability. They are, they are, in my culture, they're tearing it up. That means they're advancing. And the enemy can't stop it. So we see in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, due to Paul's persecution of the ecclesia, the ecclesia is actually dispersed after Stephen dies. We know he was martyred. And namely, the, the Hellenized Jews uh, the, the Jews who spoke Greek and formerly lived outside of Judea, everything was dispersed uh, in Acts chapter 8. Let's move forward here. And I'm glancing down. In Acts chapter 9, we see, we see uh, Saul being saved, and he is going to shift his focus from catching and destroying Christians, believers, into becoming part of Christ's ecclesia. So Paul's conversion comes about two years after Pentecost and about six months after the persecution. So Paul, remember he's watching Stephen being stoned? 
right from a distance, Saul was his name. He's watching Stephen being stoned. And so six months later, the Lord encounters him because I believe there was a bunch of people, there was a bunch of believers who were praying for this guy named Saul who was persecuting the church. So I don't think they were cursing him. I think they were praying for him. And I think there's a big difference. Remember, binding and loosing is hearing from heaven and bringing it to earth. It's not cursing the darkness as much as it is living in response to what the Father is saying. So I believe that Saul became a target of intercession for the ecclesia because he was persecuting the ecclesia. So much so it moved the hand of the Lord and while he's riding with his donkey, there's another blast from heaven. Right? And he, he's knocked off his his uh, donkey, or whatever, and he can't see, he's blinded, and the Lord uses, another, you know, he uses Ananias, who was it, Bart, wait, Ananias, right? Ananias? Okay, uses him, and so, anyway, the, so he, he becomes converted, he knows Jesus, and now the villain becomes almost the hero. I mean, that's how quick the Lord can shift a city. That's how quick the Lord can turn the tables. That's why there's never a hopeless situation. Never. If we're praying and we're interceding and we're, and we're governing and legislating, the Lord can turn the tables in a moment. And here's this one that was, you know, you, sometimes we think that that person will never get saved. That person is so in such a dark place and they're, crushing the church in our city and no no don't push the panic button just get people around you that are praying for that person and the lord can do for your city my city a province a nation what he did with saul in a moment he's converted not because someone preached a sermon it was intercession that led to an encounter and the encounter was with Jesus because Jesus says why are you persecuting me and so we see Paul's conversion so we see Acts chapter 9 covering about two years and then between Acts 9 and Acts 10 there's a gap of about three years anyway this is all in your this is all in your workbook we don't have time to to actually go into you guys could you guys can look it up and chew it up and all that kind of good stuff. We just know that eventually what happened was the ecclesia moves, the, the epicenter of the ecclesia moves from Jerusalem and now travels to Antioch. And remember that in Antioch, Antioch was the third greatest Roman city of the, of the day. Rome being number one, Alexandria being number two, and Antioch being number three. And Antioch was probably around, I don't know, 300,000, so, something like that. Huge population. It was, a, it was a metropolitan city. Let's just say it's kind of like Manila. And so, because it was the third largest city in the empire. And so, Paul leads his three missionary journeys out of Antioch. In Jerusalem, in A.D. 70, the temple is wiped out, but the ecclesia is alive and well. And in the persecution that we see in Acts chapter 8, the, the scripture says that the people were scattered out of Jerusalem, but they weren't panicking. They were scattered out of Jerusalem, and the word says they preached the gospel everywhere. Why? Because they were not dependent on a building. They were not even dependent on a pastor. They were the ecclesia because that's the paradigm they had. So they, they knew Jesus, they had authority, they had the Holy Spirit, they had ability, and then when the persecution came and Saul was tearing it up in the city and he was destroying Jerusalem and they were scattered, Stephen is killed, Stephen was a type of seed that was, that was killed, and all of a sudden there's a scattering, and when Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, until the ends of the earth, that happened as a result of 
a persecution, but the persecution didn't destroy the ecclesia, it only strengthened it. Wow. Guys, can we, gals too, ladies and gentlemen, can we just please keep it simple? Can we just not complicate it? There's too much work to be done to complicate things. And if the enemy can get us fighting with each other, we lose our cities. And we have to say that the cities have to come to know Jesus while it's my time. It's my shift. It's not going to be my shift maybe 30 years from now. Maybe it might be. Maybe 40 years from now. Maybe, but not, definitely not 100 years from now. So I'm not going to allow my cities to crumble on my shift. I'm not going to have division trample our churches on my shift. I'm going to be a balm of Gilead. I'm going to be a healing agent. And I want to become the ecclesia that Christ has called me to be, carrying the authority of the government of heaven and the ability and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to go ahead and I want to do what he tells me to do. Instead of getting all indoctrinated with everything else around us, and you know that could happen. Right? So we're arguing with our brother, but we really should be penetrating the gates. Can we say amen? Yeah. All right. So this is all in your notes because I want to get to Ecclesia in the home. And I want to, have a, I want to pray for you all. Let's just look at the 21 observations about Christ's ecclesia. Let's, if you could turn there, if that's still on the same page. I had to turn pages, but maybe it's, it's right there in front of you. 21 observations as we were concluding the book of Acts. Christ's ecclesia is Christ-centered. It's the revelation of Jesus is preeminent and worship is central. Number two, Christ's ecclesia is Christ-encountered. In other words... Christ's ecclesia, there's intimacy with Jesus. It's vitally connected to the vine. Number three, Christ's ecclesia is indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit. I want you guys to say amen on that. I'm still harping on that. Amen on that because it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Again, not optional equipment. Number four, Christ's ecclesia loves the world. When I'm talking about the world, I'm not talking about the world system. I'm talking about people. All right? So Christ's ecclesia loves the world. Ecclesia loves what Jesus loves, and Jesus loves the lost. Jesus doesn't curse the lost. Jesus loves the lost. Aren't you glad he didn't give up on you? Aren't you glad he redeemed you? Aren't you glad he found you? The Holy Spirit tracked you down. The conviction of the Holy Spirit brought you to a place of receiving Jesus. Aren't you glad when, when you didn't love him, he loved you? It says in the scriptures that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. Jesus loves our cities. I'll say it again. Jesus loves our cities. Mm. Number five, Christ's ecclesia is consecrated. Members are set apart, called out with a clear sense of duty and responsibility. They faithfully, quote, show up when the council meets. When does the council meet? On Sundays. It's not a church service. It's an ecclesia gathering. Amen. Amen. Christ's ecclesia governs through prayer. Everyone say amen. amen. This is to be our number one functional identity. Everybody prays. Everything is fueled by prayer. It's not the four or five, you know, ten, you know, grandmas who are praying in the prayer meeting. Everybody prays should have a banner in your church saying, everybody prays. In fact, you should have everybody, whatever, have maybe three or four of them. Everyone prays. Everyone shares their faith. Everybody, it's everybody. 
It's not the pastor who carries the load. It's everybody we're doing it. Why? Because we're God's government. Where's Ecclesia? Christ's Ecclesia is covenantal. Covenants one with another, bonded in unity of voice, purpose, and love for one another. Having food together, having snacks together, taking a break at 1030 and having a snack. We covenant with one another. It's people-centered, not building-centered. It's people-centered, not building-centered. Christ's ecclesia is commission-focused. The target of the ecclesia is the gates of Hades. Christ's ecclesia is pure of heart, maturing in union with Christ, divorced from sinful habits, established in word and righteousness. Christ's ecclesia lives and gives generously. I love that challenging verse, there was nobody in need, in Acts chapter 2. Christ's ecclesia engages the culture Monday through Saturday. Daily lifestyle rather than a weekly meeting. Christ's ecclesia, success is measured by how much a city is looking like heaven. The measure of success for Christ's ecclesia is heaven coming to earth. Matthew 6, 10. On earth as it is in heaven. So it's God's kingdom breaking into a city. It's the invisible kingdom being made known through people. Christ's ecclesia. Christ's ecclesia's passion is to fulfill the will and the dream of God. Matthew 6, Matthew 16, Matthew 28. The scripture in Matthew 28 is, as you go, disciple and baptize nations. That means as you live your life, when you leave this building, disciple nations. Look for the one. Bless the one. Fellowship with the one. Minister to the one. And then proclaim the kingdom to the one. As we go, discipleship, and the Great Commission is not a program, it's a lifestyle. Christ's Ecclesia brings hope, answers, and solutions to the world. It's salt, it's light, and it's yeast. John 3, 17, Father did not send his Son to condemn the world, but, the world, through the world, but, but save the world uh, through him. Sorry about that. Christ, uh, number 15, Christ Ecclesia is characterized as a prophetic culture where there is continual encouragement, exhortation, and comfort given to the world. I mean, we need to be the most encouraging people on the planet. I tell our people, I just want you to turn next to, to the someone next to you and just give them a word of encouragement. Sometimes they don't know what to do. I said, start with, you have nice hair. I mean, start, start with something. Because we live in a very critical, negative culture. Everything is criticized. I mean, the, 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 the culture of the ecclesia is always, listen, what does Paul say? He says, literally, desire spiritual gifts. The word, there is, the word there is lust. Lust after spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. Bring encouragement to people. Call out the golden people. Don't call out the dirt. Everyone can see the dirt. Look for the gold and call it out. Call out their destiny. Call out their future. We should be doing that at least among those in the ecclesia. If we had more time, I would just move you into a time where we just release prophetic words over each other. I mean, that's so simple, but it's yet so needed. I have never met somebody who, would, who told me, would you please stop encouraging me? I've had enough. I have never said to anybody, you know what? That's way too much encouragement. I, I just can't take it. The truth is, we need to be encouraged. You know what encouragement means? 
Literally, the word means to put courage in. Encouragement is not some weak word. It's actually doing something where you put courage in somebody. That's what the word encouragement means. Encourage. Put courage in me. Find somebody you can put courage into. There's enough encouragement to come back, splash back on you. Give, and it shall be given. That's kingdom. Oh, I can go another place, but I'm not going to. Number 16, Christ's ecclesia moves in supernatural power, destroying the works of darkness in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Signs and wonders and miracles can't be something that we just sing about or talk about. At some point, the supernatural has to become natural. These signs will follow those who believe. Wow. Yeah, we have to be relentless with that. You know, every miracle is an expression of the goodness and the love of God. Every miracle demonstrates and declares the nature and the goodness of God. Isn't that amazing? So we can declare it, or I can show somebody God's goodness by them being healed. Wow. Ecclesia is vitally connected to, to and serves others with both joy and humility. Number 18, Christ's Ecclesia is bold, fearless, and unstoppable. Everyone say unstoppable. Christ's Ecclesia binds and looses by continually bringing heaven wherever they go. Things that, they are trying to find it there for you, things that, that don't exist in heaven do not exist on earth, and things that exist in heaven exist on earth. Number 20, Christ's Ecclesia provides a clear purpose for every believer extending the rule and reign until his return. And then lastly, Christ's ecclesia is largely apostolic rather than pastoral. In every meeting that I have, I, really, I do believe this. There are, there are apostles who are trying to... They're, they're wearing a pastor's title, but they're really apostolic and you feel a little trapped. Now, I just want to give you permission. You can put your wings out, and you can, you can be apostolic without trying to fit into a pastor's role, just trying to figure out what that means. And the Lord is the one who kind of, the Lord is the one who actually widens our sphere of influence. You know, don't try and kick a door in. Promotion, there's always a process before a promotion. For Joseph, it was 15 years before he was promoted. He had the promise, but there was the process. And so that's when God takes out the Holy Ghost chisel and begins chiseling away on us to actually shape us and fit us into our calling. Amen? Amen? All right, so let's just go to the, well, I'm going to go past Discipling Nations. You guys have had Ed here, does a really good, Ed, Dr. Savoso, he has a great job on Discipling Nations and just really practical about baptizing nations. I recommend that you would go ahead and grab his book on the Ecclesia and check that out. That, that's just brilliant work. And uh, so I, I have the, those notes in there for you. And really, uh, Luke chapter 10 needs to be noted. Um, prayer walking needs to be noted. You know, all these things. I know there's people who, I mean, Sean Foyt, other people who bring worship to the streets. 
bring the presence of God to the streets. And I just really encourage you along those lines. But it's really important that the church is known for blessing and moving prophetically in our city. And people are going to respond more from the treasure that's called out in them than the sin that's declared over them. You have to say amen to that. Come on. All right. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to finish up. I want to talk to you about ecclesia in the home. And we, wanted, we started at the gates in Matthew 16, 18. We talked about Caesarea Philippi. We talked about the mandate that Jesus told us. We talked about that there's no option. But what's important is that what we want to do is we want to start at the gates and we really want to finish in the home. Because we can, uh, as pastors, we can preach ecclesia from the pulpit. As business people, we could talk about ecclesia, act like we could really, we could build, we can train, we could do all kinds of things, but it has to impact our home first. And so, I don't know what page you're on, 22. I won't tell you what page I'm on, but it's bigger than that. So what is... So what is the household and its importance as a foundation of the ecclesia? In order to establish a stake in the ground, our life begins with Jesus, and we have the assignment to be Christ's ecclesia. We know that out of Matthew chapter 8, 16, and verse 18. Upon this, this confession of faith, I will build my, what's the word? The most foundational principle of ecclesia representation in the New Testament is in the Greek word oikos, which means household. The New Testament household includes both family and the workplace. Oikos is the dwelling place of the family, the household. It's the household of relationships and the influence that family has. So oikos, or household, I always saw you sitting there with your Bible open. That was it. I wasn't sitting there with my Bible open so my son could see me. I'm sitting there with my Bible open because I'm reading it as a disciple not a pastor. It's true. Sometimes as pastors, the time we read the Bible is to study for something instead of just being a disciple and going to the book. Not to get a sermon, just to get close to Father. But it's striking to me something that simple is remembered 20 22, 23 years later, still making an impression. So read the word daily and let your kids see, get in on it. Read the word with your kids. Talk about scripture. When they're younger, it's easy. You could talk about, you know, whatever. When they get older, it's about eschatology. You know, crazy stuff, you know. When's Jesus going to come back? Where's that in the Bible, you know? And so... So, but let that, let that build in your family. Let their, I just pray that that, that that memory would come to your children where they would see you. They, they remember at least a part of like, I know dad was always in the word and that brought security to him as a child. Right? Number three, think biblically. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to this pattern, the pattern of this world, but be transformed through what? Renewing your mind. So I was a young youth pastor. I know I look young, but I looked younger then. It's a joke. Yeah, I'm only, I'm only 42. So, <laughs> quit lying, Pastor Greg. Okay. But I remember as a young youth pastor, I, 
I, I really looked up to our senior pastor. And I just wanted to spend time with him. So I made an appointment. We had a big church. I was a youth pastor of a big church. And I made an appointment with him, finally got into the talk to, talking to him, and I said, okay, I'm ready. I have my notepad out. You know, I'm sitting there. He's across the desk. And I said, okay, what's the one thing you can tell me as a disciple that you would just want to, as a father, just give to me? You know, and he thought, and he thought for about a minute. And this is, this is what he said. Number three, think biblically. So I wrote down, think biblically, and I put a period on the end of the word, and I looked at him. He said, think biblically. Wow. Ephesians 4.23 says, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. So what, what's he saying? He says, have a mind that's renewed by the word. Because where I was at, I needed to be constantly making decisions on my feet. And if I don't have a mind that's, that's soaked in the Word, then the, the, the counsel I give can be something other than this. So I'm being led by the Spirit, but I'm, my mind is immersed in the Word. It's important to react to things facing even home life in a biblical manner. Our actions are mere expressions of how we think. Right here. In order to see that happen, we must be people of prayer and the word. We say amen? Yes. Number four. Ecclesia in the home. Right? Pray continuously. Bible daily. Think biblical. Number four, walk morally. Psalm 15, verse 2, verse 1, Lord, who may dwell in your secret tent? Who may live in your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others. Woo! You know, it wouldn't matter how many sermons I preached if my life did not support it. You know who's the first to see whether your life supports it? Your family. I'm not talking about an occasional bad day. Because we have those. Like I'll walk into the house and something's got me. I'm a little, I'm a little like I'm not like this when I walk in the house. I'm a little, something's got me, I'm a little on edge. My family actually feels it if I walk in the home like that. And I know it. Anyone ever done that? Come on, let's be honest. And it's like, you know, they're afraid to say hi to me. Sometimes, you know, back then. Hi, Dad. Are you okay, Dad? So, so my sermons and my life need to match. And it doesn't matter if I preached 2,000 sermons and, and 100,000 people get saved if my life does not match what I preach. I'll say this, my life, my life, how I live my life is the greatest sermon. Is the greatest sermon. Nothing even comes close. So the reason why so many pastor's kids leave ministry, they don't go into ministry, which is a shame, but they, they're, they're hurt. And it's like they've seen this, but in the home it's different. So let your life be your greatest sermon. Let your life be an offering to God. Let it be incense to your family. 
Let your son and your daughters, your sons and your daughters look at you. Say, that, that's a man of integrity. That's a man who walks morally. Not because he's saying something on Sunday morning. It's because I see it. I see it when I wake up. I see it when I go to sleep. I've seen it year after year after year after year. When the tide's going this way, my dad is swimming this way morally. That's how you build a legacy. You see, an inheritance is what you leave to someone. A legacy is what you leave in someone. We need to be people who focus on legacy, not just inheritance. Wow, it's quiet. Number five, love unconditionally. Say amen. It's good to have the joy of the Lord fill your heart. Say amen. 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of? I like to say this to my kids. It's not I love you if. It's not I love you because. It's I love you, period. Remember, try and keep it simple. It's not I love you if, it's not I love you because, because those are all based on conditions, a little bit of condition. I love you, period. This is unconditional. This is how God loves us. This is what our homes need to be filled with. You know, my daughter, she's 28, she has two sets of twins, so you guys can pray for her anytime you want. We talked with her today on FaceTime, praise God for technology. And so they were in the van, and we were, Wendy has FaceTime, they're in the van, and they were singing The Greatest Showman. You guys ever watch that movie? So it's like, whoa, whoa, this is the greatest show, you know? That's amazing, we're just jumped, jumped right into their van. And there they are, hi, Bops. Oh, you're funny. That's the first thing my granddaughter said to me. My five-year-old. She, you know, when he's on there, hi, you guys. Oh. I get on the screen. Hi, Bops. And that, no kidding. Two seconds later, you're funny. This morning at 5 a.m. Oh, my goodness. My heart just like, oh. But my little, my little girl, Hannah, I remember when she was very, very little, I said to her, this is the phrase I said, I keep it simple, right? So I looked at her, and she, ra she was raised with this phrase. Yes, all of them were raised with this phrase. No matter what you do, Daddy will always love you. Because the man brings, the father brings the identity. The Father brings it out the purpose and the calling and the gifts in their children. So it's no matter... Wives could do that too, moms. But the Father, that's kind of his... So no matter what you do, Daddy will always love you. And she remembers that phrase to this day. And I remember something happened three or four years ago, I don't even know the event, but I remember her saying, I never have ever felt insecure about your love for me. Now, I'm the natural father. You know what that means to me? I just translated God. Like, I was the human example of a heavenly father that no matter what Hannah has ever done, he'll keep loving her. She saw it through me. It, through my imperfections, right? <laughs> through my imperfections, she saw that in me, and she still remembers. No matter what you do, Daddy will always love you. Because of the sound, I love you if, or if I love you because, it's because I love you, period. You're my kid. 
Number six, forgive wholeheartedly. Oh, man. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Wow, there's the measure. Has the Lord forgiven you? Yeah. And then forgive others. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate for one another, forgiving each other just as Christ has forgiven you. The family is probably the greatest training ground to learn how to forgive. Can we say amen to that? This is where we get to practice 70 times 7 is in our families. It's important to forgive, and it's also important for the person to say you're forgiven. So we've taught our kids to not only, if they've offended somebody or hurt somebody, say, say, will you forgive me? And then the receiver says, yes, you're forgiven. So the receiver doesn't say, yes, I know. <laughs> this, it's important for the receiver to say you're forgiven so the person who's, who's asking for forgiveness recognizes that they've been forgiven. And there's healing both ways. All right? So it's important to forgive, and it's also important to say that you're forgiven. Either we forgive or we become bitter. Unforgiveness is a jail sentence for the person who won't forgive. When we don't forgive, we put ourselves in prison. And the root of bitterness grows in our heart. That's why Jesus says, don't even pray the Lord's Prayer unless you've, you've forgiven somebody from where? From the heart. That little addition, not from the head, from here. Forgive from the heart. All right? Number seven, live joyfully. Say, yeah. Nehemiah 8.10, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Proverbs 17.22, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. In your homes, carry an attitude of joy. Joy is not dependent on events. That's where we get the word happiness. Happiness comes from the word happenstance. Happiness is based on conditions. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Joy comes from heaven and lands in the heart and it's cultivated. That's why it says to be joyful in God, to have the joy of the Lord. Joy makes one approachable. You ever sense something that they're, someone's just not, they're irritated, it's a little harder to approach them. But joy does make one approachable. Joy makes one likable. Joy determines whether your children or your spouse want to be near you. There's a big difference in your, in your kids wanting to be near you and having to be near you. My family responds way better to me when I'm joyful. I set, now this is in our home, I set the temperature. I set the emotional temperature in my household. If I'm joyful, it impacts the whole family. Men, we carry the temperature. We're the thermostats in our home. We set the temperature in our home. We either choose joy, because joy, joy has to be chosen sometimes, just like an attitude. You can't just have a bad attitude. You chose it. And you can have a positive attitude because you chose it. Because an attitude is empty, and you choose to put whatever you want in that attitude. And God always gives you at least 15 seconds to make that determination. 
Isn't that true? So you can choose joy or you can not choose joy. And sometimes I set that thermostat low when I walk in the house. And it wasn't a result of anything any of my kids did. It's just that I didn't have a great day. But I got to remember that ministry doesn't stop at the office when I leave to go home. There's another part of ministry that just begins that's more important. It's ministry to my family. I'm a priest of my home. Oh, are you guys there? So ask the Lord to fill you with joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a legal prayer. It's a good prayer. Number eight, sacrifice daily. Oh, man. This is good. Greater love has no man than lay down his life for his friends. Let each of you look not only on your own interests, but on the interests of others. This is a little harder. Sacrifice is about preferring other people. Its focus is not on you. Its focus is on your family. It's taking the bullet for your family. It's laying down your life. Sacrifice involves love, priority, and responsibility. This does not mean that you don't have your time. It's just a matter of priority. We all struggle to die to ourselves. We need to be servants in, our, in the homes. This means that we need to go the extra mile. What would it be like if our home, in our homes if we sacrifice daily for one another? Wow. You know, I never had to teach my kids how to be selfish. They just have that, they were born with it. Sinful nature. I had to teach them to be generous. I had to teach them to give. I had to teach, they're, they're like, mine, 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 mine. Mine, mine, mine. Mine. And then if it's theirs, if it's someone else's, that's mine. If someone has a blue Super Bowl instead of a red Super Bowl, he wants the blue. That's my, mine. My, my, mine. Me, me, me. My, my, my. So we're trying to train our kids to be selfless, to give. And we know once they get saved, a lot of that shifts. They have the ability to do so, but we're still, we're still sacrificing for our own children. Can you say amen to that? All right. Give generously. Generosity is first a mindset before it becomes an action. To give, in, it says in Acts chapter 2, 44 through 45, that they gave to anyone who had need. One thing that is noted in Acts 2 is just how generous they were. The ecclesia, we need to be generous with our money, our resources, our energy, and our time. In our neck of the woods, time is our greatest resource. So we have, generally I, generally I hear, dads will want to buy something for their kids, but they're looking for our time. So carve out time, because that's how you build a legacy, making time with your kids. Amen. Decide wisely. Proverbs 2, 4, uh, Proverbs 2, 6. I have to move fast. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Ask God for wisdom daily as the leaders of your home. Decide wisely. Make decisions that are not, that are not rash, but wise. But if we're, if we're biblically thinking, we're spending time in the Word, we're spending time in prayer, we're making the Lord's presence central in our homes, then the decisions that we make will become much less rash and much more wise. You see how that filters out? So a, a wise decision doesn't mean it has to be a lengthy decision or a lengthy amount of time. We can make wise decisions quickly because we're connected to the vine. Amen? Number 11, as a family, witness boldly. 
Acts 4, 29 and 31, they spoke the word of God boldly. 2 Corinthians 5, 20, we therefore are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Wow. We actually did ministry together often as a family. And we would do ministry together that would be very simple. Like go to our local park, grab about 100 water bottles, and just hand them off to people as they're walking by or jogging by. Very simple acts of ministry that we would do with our children. In fact, I do like football too, American football. So I remember these guys that are jogging. I think someone says, the day I see a happy jogger is the day I start jogging. So that was a joke, you guys. Okay, so... So we would have water bottles, and it was great ministry because we would have the name of our, you know, Convergence House of Prayer on it. Sometimes we would have it, sometimes we wouldn't. Our park is two miles long. People would be walking together. And then every once in a while I see a guy running. I could tell he has an Adidas cap, you know. He's, a, he's an athlete, I could tell. So I'll get the water bottle like this, and I'll say, uh, I'll just pretend I'm a 49er quarterback, you know, Kaepernick or something. Or Well, anyway, that's a sore subject. But... I'll have a water bottle and say, hey, man, go out for a pass. No kidding. These guys who are jogging light up like they just, they're, they're playing pro football. So here I am with a water bottle. My son's right here, and I get the water bottle, and I just, and he'll start, he'll start, he's jogging, but now he's going to take off like he's Jerry Rice or he's some wide receiver for the 49ers. And I'll just take my water bottle, and I'll be the quarterback, and I'll throw it. It's always is a, usually a good, it's a good throw usually. So, and he'll just catch it in stripes. What happened? My kids are seeing me having fun doing ministry. So ministry was not a drudgery. Ministry was life. Ministry was joyful. And then when we struck a conversation, I bring my son into it, and I'm talking to somebody, maybe they don't make a decision to know Jesus, but they know that we connected and we were friends. Ministry is enjoyable. Let your kids see ministry being enjoyable. Let them see it being fun. Because I think it is. Oh, you guys, come on. So witness boldly. Let your kids see it. Our homes need to be inception points and invitations to those who don't know the Lord. Pray throughout your neighborhood. Prayer walk your neighborhood. Believe for the Lord in that sphere of influence. Number 12, parent courageously. Joshua 24, 15, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Parenting is not for the weak or the timid. It requires loving boldness, a sense of courageousness to lead them into the fullness of God's plan and purpose for their lives. How do people know that our kids are just not perfect? My kids made mistakes, but I used their mistakes as an opportunity to teach. And I gave our kids room. We gave our kids room. The biggest thing that we worked on with our children is communication. Because if they can stay open to us, even when they make mistakes, we still have influence in their life. I'd rather have them make mistakes under my roof where there's communication than them making mistakes and concealing it because they think we're unapproachable. Does that make sense? So there are things you're going to have to do as a parent as you allow your, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep this all tied into Ecclesia because it is, you're governing. You're parenting courageously. You're governing, you're legislating in your home. But do so out of a place of love, not legalism. Oh, come on. Rules minus Relationship equal rebellion.
you have, we have to be able to have wisdom for the rules, the structure of our homes, but if the relationship isn't in place, then our kids will tend to rebel. So what do we do? We try and tighten up the rules. But they're longing for a relationship. So when they're very young, build the relationship. Say things like, no matter what you do, Daddy will always love you. Pull them close to you. They're not a hindrance to your ministry. <laughs> they are your ministry. Number 13, meals regularly. Everybody say amen, amen. to that. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, Acts chapter 2. We see Luke 9, 9, 16 and 17. We see Deuteronomy 12, 7. You know, we live in the San Francisco Bay Area. I don't know about Metro Manila, but it's extremely busy where we live. There's a lot of dual income, but we try and carve out time to just eat together. We'll go to Starbucks together. We'll have a latte together. I'll never have a latte, personally. I won't have the foo-foo drinks like cappuccinos and frappuccinos and just give me coffee. Just the way the Lord made it. Do you know the coffee bean is a fruit? Hey, that qualifies for a Daniel fast. When it's fruits and vegetables, baby, I got my coffee because it's a fruit. That counts. Unless the Lord tells me otherwise. You know, I got to... Got to leave a little room this way, you know. Number 14. Where did I just leave off at? Meals regularly. Eat together. And I, I, that doesn't even need to be said here. So we're just going to go to 14. Work diligently. We're going to move fast. Work diligently. Whatever you find to do with our hands, do with all our might. Work is worship. Your work is worship. You got to think about that. You, your work is worship. Always do more than what's expected as you serve in the workplace. Your labor is worship unto God. Christians should be known as the most diligent, most excellent, most trusted employees. Period. Why? Because we do it unto the Lord. We do it unto the Lord. So we had somebody recently, and their work was substandard. They're working inside our church. Their work was up, substandard. And I shared, I said, you might be able to get away with it from me because I am... But I tell you who is watching, the one who gives promotion is watching. So when you work diligently and you work above what's expected, the Lord sees it. And the Lord is the one who is the promoter. So in our families, let's create a, a solid work ethic as worship. All right? Number 15. Play intentionally. John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more. I've, I think I've, I've talked to several people who've told me about, yeah, when you talk about pray intentionally, you tell your story. I'm looking at my notes. I don't even have a story. But there is a story. Right? And so my little girl is, oh, how old is she? Three. And she used to call a backpack a pack pack. So, you know, when they're that cute, there's nothing really they can do wrong. Well, they can do something wrong. But when they're that little girl, and she's like, comes up to you, and she's going to school, and she goes, Daddy, do you have my pack pack? And I'm just like, yes, I have a, I have $100, too. I, I have whatever you want. Just, you know, she has big old blue eyes. Gets it from the Norwegian. And she just looks at me, oh, pack pack. I just fall apart. I won't show her that. I'm more like, yeah, I'm your dad. So 
we used to own a two-story house, and she used to have her room here, and our room was right next to hers. She had it all, Wendy had it all, you know, girly, pink, and, you know, all this stuff, right? Well, she had this, she has this tea set, and here I am, I'm Joe Pastor, right? And 6'2", you know, a little, much thinner, but still skinnier. But anyway, so she goes, Daddy, can we play tea party? And I said, yes. So I make sure, no, there was no iPhones. No one's taking a picture of me. No, I'm kidding. So there we are. We sit down. And I'm on the floor. She's on the floor. She has, and then she gets the, you know, she gets the little pot. The pot's like this big. And the cups are like tiny cups. And she's like, Daddy, do you want some tea? I said, yes, I would love some tea. So she goes, Psh. And I would get the tea, and I'd say, mm, mm, mm. that's the best tea I've ever had in my whole life. Now, it was all pretend. There was no water. It was all pretend. You should see her face like this. You want more? I said, oh, I would love some more. Do you have more? She's like, yeah. So she gets it. She makes this sound. And I'd grab the cup, and I'd drink it, and I'd say, mmm, mmm, mmm. That has got to be the best tea I've ever had in my whole life. Want some more? 30 minutes. 30 minutes playing tea party with my 30, my my 28-year-old. And she just got to tell me just a couple, a couple weeks ago. I go, remember Tea Party, honey? Oh, yeah. I remember Tea Party. I'm like, please don't ask me again. <laughs> you are 28 years old. <laughs> play Tea Party. But I'm ready, for my, I'm ready for my five-year-old if she wants to play Tea Party. My, five, my granddaughter. My granddaughter who's five, five years old. The other one is, I have an 18-year-old, and they're into all that social media stuff. Instagram, Snapchat, you know, Snapchat, you know, all the, all the, all the, like, you know, and so, you know, she's 16, 17 years old, 18 years old, and she's, and she's wanting to film. She's the only one who wants to film her dad for all of her, like, thousands of friends. How embarrassing that might be. So she's like, Dad, do something crazy, you know? Oh, and I, the one thing I do is I do this impersonation of Yoda, right? From Star Wars, right? So I'm doing this, and that, that's just a family thing. That's a family thing. We've got to keep some things in the doors of the house that do not extend beyond the walls of the house to, you know, social media sphere. But she keeps pressing me. So I caved in. And she absolutely loves that I caved in. Well, well people like, no, I'll go, people, people are going to think that's so weird. She goes, no, they're gonna, my friends are going to love it. I'm like, no, they're not going to love it. Yes, they are, Dad, please, please, please. Okay. So I said, <clears throat> you know, I'm talking like Yoda, right? And, I, and then I let her film it. And I let her post it. And it goes down to whoever. But for her... At 18, that's playing together. With my little girl, it was tea party. With my 18-year-old youngest daughter, it's Instagram. Jordan was civilized. We played football. We played basketball. We did man stuff. You know, we did that kind of stuff together. But with my girls... Oh, man, that's a whole new world. The last one is Church Weekly. I call it Ecclesia Weekly. It says, Not forsaking the assembling together of our saints as a matter of some, but exhorting one another so much more, the more as you see the day approaching. So we, we worked hard on letting the church gathering 
be the priority in our home and one of the highlights of our week. So one thing I love about Wendy, I appreciate about her, is that she literally started, because she's a pastor's wife, right? We raised our kids in the church. And so one of the things that she did is that church started with our family on Saturday night. So she would actually have an alarm on her phone, just come on up, get ready for church. And so we would begin preparing for church on Saturday night. Now, we didn't have a church service, but we were getting in that mode. And like she just said, like she's getting their hearts engaged in tomorrow morning's meeting. And so we're preparing them, we're preparing them, and what's so important is, for me, when they become 18 in our country, they become a legal, legal adult, I don't want to lose my kids. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't want to lose my kids. I want my kids to love going to church. I want my kids to enjoy it. You know, there's some things I'll tell them and some things I won't. There's some times I'll protect them, protect their hearts, and there's some, thing, some things I will reveal to them. But that Sunday morning meeting, that's going to be life for them. And so we've always, she started getting them ready early, and then we had three kids. And I don't know what your thing is. She's up first thing in the morning. I'm getting ready to be in the office, you know, go to the meeting. She's, she gets herself completely ready first before the kids even wake up. Just gets them ready, and then when the kids wake up, it's all on with the kids. All three of them. We only had three. Some of you have more. If you have ten, that's a prayer meeting right there. <laughs> if you have ten, you better have a group interceding for you, because you're going to have kids running around everywhere. Oh, I got to get this. Oh, he took that. He didn't take this. I had that. You know. So you have this whole thing going on. I'm hungry. You know? So you have a whole thing going on all the time. But you guys... That's where it all begins. It all begins. Ecclesia, governing and legislating, it all begins in our home. Our homes have to become the inception points. What if we had 10,000 homes in the metro Manila area that were committed to be ecclesias? What if you had 100,000 homes in the metro Manila that were functioning as ecclesias? What would your church service be like? Really. So what we did in the back of your workbook, I, I, I forgot about this, so I'm sorry I'm going over. But in the back of your workbook, there's a couple resources. In the very back, you can see our kids and our grandchildren. They're in the very back. But Wendy talked about them. We, had, we did something called My Home and Ecclesia. Do you see that? And this was actually a, something that Wendy put together where uh, it's actually a card. So you see on the front, it says, My Home and Ecclesia. You have a black and white copy. Um, and then on the back of that card, you'll see some, like a wood stake and the oil. Do you guys see that there? So that was <coughs> actually a front and back card. Why don't you come up and tell me just a little bit about that? And we're just giving this to you as a resource because you might want to deploy it. You might want to deploy it in your family. You might want to, if you're a church leader, you might want to do something a little bit, just as an idea, to kind of get your, your, your um, folks, as you preach ecclesia, to say, let's start in the home. Let's make our homes an ecclesia, and this becomes a declaration. So where did you go? I'm right here. Okay. <laughs> so um, I love prophetic acts, and so that's what this really is. Um, the stake in the ground is like the tent peg that it basically is like a, a popsicle stick, anything like that that you can ride on and that you can drive into the actual soil around your home. If you're, you know, um, apartments, you might have a plant. You know, that's just, that's your soil. So it's just, it's a declaration, a prophetic act that, that we do. And um, actually even opening the door, the front door and inviting Jesus in as the commander-in-chief, as the CEO of your home. And then um, this anointing oil is just, it's a, this actual uh, recipe is out of Psalms, this 23rd Psalm. And uh, 
but it, any oil that just anointing your your home, the doorposts, and and setting forth um, the anointing of the Lord, just making the mark. So, you know, if you have wayward children, pray in their room. Take authority. You have authority. It's your home. You're the you're the head. The mom, the the priest of your home, and um, this is it's it works. It really does work, and so that's that's what this that's basically what this is. And so, um, yeah, some of it just gives you can read it. It gives reasons to why the certain essential oils in in the um, vial and just kind of some prophetic meanings and that kind of stuff. So. Um, it's very encouraging <laughs> for you to do. I believe that once you do a prophetic act, then God follows up with his answer. You know, it's a spiritual release. Prophetic obedience brings forth a spiritual release, and that's, that's what we did practically for our body. Amen. She was the instigator of all that, so I had her come up and share it. But we're late. So, we're I know, late. I know, I know we're late. We're late. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, we started at the gates. We ended in the home. Because that's the inception point of Ecclesia. So I want to pray for all of your homes and all your families. Let's stand. And then we want to do a, a commissioning. And then we'll let you guys get more lunchy food. Good food. So I'm going to have Wendy just pray for our homes, and then I'm going to grab the mic, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude it. But I just want you guys to get into receive mode. This is what we call receive mode. Our hands are out, and they're extended like we're going to receive a gift. Okay, I'll have Wendy pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just bless, 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 bless our homes. Bless our families, God. Drive the stake in the ground. This is the day that the Lord has made for our homes and for our families to arise and take their place in the kingdom of heaven. We declare as a signpost that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord and that no weapon formed against us shall prosper for you are mighty. You are mighty. You are the king of of kings and you are the CEO of our homes. We open, we open our front door and we invite you in. We say, have dominion, take dominion in our homes. Yes, that you reign and you rule in our homes and in our families. Lord, take us deeper into you together as a unit, as a unit for, um, I'm just seeing that Three cords cannot be easily broken. Yeah. Three cords cannot be easily broken. So bind us together in your love. Yeah, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Bind us together, together, that we would be entwined together and linked, link shields, linking shields together. Yeah, bringing forth strength. Encourage together, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Breathe on us, breathe on us, breathe on us as priests of our home. Breathe on us, breathe on our families. Life, 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 life. Spring forth, O oh well. Spring up, O oh well. Spring up, O oh well. Spring up, life, 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 life. A well spring, well spring of life. Let it spring forth. Let it spring forth. Yes, yes, yes. River, the river of God. The river of God is flowing in you and through you. You're not just a, a, a lake, a confined water source that will get um, yucky and mucky. You are a river, river, river of God, river of God, a wellspring. Yes, that brings forth life. And the river flows in the path of least resistance. 
So we just flow with you, Holy Spirit. We flow with you, Jesus, Father, with your love. Yeah, ebb and flow, ebb and flow together. So just, uh, we just ask for a hedge of protection around us and around our households. Yeah, we just claim your um, hedge of protection and your banner that is over us is love. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I just want to, I feel like we should just pray hope over your family. So, Lord, if there's any wayward children, we call them home. We just call them home. Call them to the place of the cross. We call them to the place of their divine purpose and destiny. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would begin to draw them once again to the foot of the cross. And so we say, we, de we, we declare, come home. Come home to Jesus. Come home to the Lord. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Fill our hearts with hope. In the name of the Lord, I pray for prosperity over every home and over every family. In the name of Jesus, I pray that the windows of heaven would be opened up. I pray for divine supply in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that all of us would leave a legacy. The legacy will be in our children. Lord, we're responsible, but Lord God, we leave the legacy. Lord, what, let there be fresh deposits in their hearts of kingdom work, kingdom activity, the love of God, the joy of the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit, all those things, Lord. And we want to govern from our homes. We want, to be, we want our homes to be dwelling places where the presence of God delights to dwell in, in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that our homes burn bright with the love of God.